everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters. Come and eat. Listen diligently to me and eat what is good. It's like a fabric made of thousands of threads. It makes a beautiful picture. And if you start preaching about one thing, well, you can bring this in and this in and this in and this subject. And eventually you're weaving these threads together, especially if you have a fairly in-depth in -depth and comprehensive uh, understanding, comprehension of the scriptures. And next thing you know, you're teaching the whole Bible and the whole gospel message. And what you thought was going to be a half hour teaching is now three hours later or part one of 20 parts or whatever and you're preaching all the way from Genesis to Revelation so that's why I often use notes it's not because I don't know my material I write my own notes and and do my own uh, stuff my own research but I want to stay on track so I I, I don't uh, don't make it too worrisome for the uh, the listeners we have a new motto I don't know a motto or a for our ministry and it's 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 like a catchphrase and this is really what we're about Hoshana Rabbah Biblical Discipleship Resources and this is Congregation Elim and where we meet together on Shabbat and but really our motto of our ministry and our congregation is this and you're gonna start seeing this slogan motto or whatever appearing and I, if I get another revelation, I, it might change a little bit, but it's gonna, basically it's this. Connecting the gospel message to its pro-Torah Hebraic roots. Connecting the gospel message to its pro-Torah Hebraic roots. That's what we're doing. We're not bringing a new message or a different message. It's kind of like what John says, the apostle in, his first, in his, his first epistle, the first, I think it's chapter one, he says, look, I'm not bringing you a new message, a new commandment, a new law. It's one you've heard from the beginning. But it is new. But it's not new. But it is new. But it's not new. It's, it's, it's the same message, but we're just filling it out and connecting the dots, not just from Matthew to Revelation, but from Genesis to Revelation. So you'll hear me and even today I'm going to be speaking on a subject you hear me teaching things that quite frankly you could probably hear a lot of this in your church of your choice on Sunday but I'm going to connect it and go deeper with the same message and connect it to its Torah roots here's a Torah scroll right here this is something that you're not going to find in too many Sunday churches it needs to be in there. You'll maybe find a Bible, and this is in the Bible, obviously, Genesis through, through uh, Deuteronomy. But we want to connect the gospel message back to the bedrock. The bedrock, the Torah. And that's what we're called to do. That's what our message is. Turning the hearts of the children back to the fathers. The prophesy, prophecy of Malachi, the last verses in the Tanakh, or the Old Testament. That, that is the Christian view or version or, or book order of the New Testament, of the Old Testament or the Tanakh. In the, in the church or in Christianity, Malachi is the last book of the Tanakh or the Old Testament. In, in Judaism, uh, Second Chronicles is. Same books, just a little different order. But for the Christians, the last verses in the, in the Old Testament is, talks about, it's a prophecy about in the last days, Mount, uh, Elijah the prophet coming to turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers. And that's all that we're doing. We're fulfilling, helping to fulfill, we're not the only ones, but helping to fulfill Bible prophecy. It's that simple. It's that, this is a prophetic ministry. Now, what I want to talk about today, and you can say, oh boy, I've heard this message a million times. Maybe in the past. I want to talk about the Lordship of Yeshua. Now, some people in the Hebrew Roots movement have a hard time with the word Lord. 
you know, been there, done that. You know, I don't care whether you call him Master or Lord, or Jesus, or Christ, or Yeshua, or Messiah. Just get your heart right and serve and obey him and love him. Come under his blood. Now, I like to use the name Yeshua because that's what his mother called him. But I'm not offended by the name Jesus. It doesn't come from Zeus. Anybody that says that is ignorant of Koine Greek, doesn't even know their, the basics of Koine Greek, doesn't even know the alphabet because it would be easy to dis disprove. But I use Yeshua because the word Yeshua means salvation. It's a Hebrew word. It's, it's, it's where we get the name Joshua from. And the name Lord. You can call it, you can say master. And just because the church looks, I used to, I grew up and was born and raised in a church. We never said Lord because that's what the Christians say. You know, you can't define who you are on the basis of who somebody is and you don't like them and you don't want to be like them. That's not the way to ascertain truth as a knee-jerk reaction against something else. So I reject that methodology. That's just simply a finding truth out of reaction and you're probably going to end up, the pendulum is going to swing clear to the other extreme. And then now you're over here where you were over here before. Let's stay in the middle and go down the middle path and let's determine truth not by what this church or that church has or doesn't have, but on the basis of what the Word of Elohim says. And if there happens to be ABC church that's preaching the truth based on the Word of Elohim, well, hallelujah! Adhere to it. If they're not teaching the truth, then throw it out. Eat the fish and spit out the bones. I don't have a problem with Lord. He is my Lord. If you want to say Master, that's fine. If you want to say Adonai or whatever, I don't care. But we're dealing with the concept here. So let's not hung up. Let's not be immature. Let's grow up and not get hung up over, over um, titles or nor names. Now, people say, well, the name Lord comes from pagan derivations. Well, maybe it does. And maybe about half the other words you speak in whatever language you're speaking, in this case English, come from pagan originations. Most, a lot of your words do. And a lot of the things you wear and the things that you do in your normal life, somehow, including the days of the week, the months of the year, and on and on, come from pagan originations. But I'm not worshiping those gods and goddesses. So if I say Monday or Sunday, I'm not worshiping the sun or the moon. I worship the Creator. And if I said first day or second day or third day, you're going to scratch, okay, now which day is that? Let's see here. Monday, Tuesday, <laughs> you're going to be counting on your fingers. And if you want to do that, that's fine. But we got to communicate with people. I'm in the communication business, so to speak. I want to communicate with people, and I don't want to use a bunch of words they don't understand. Because I want to build bridges of understanding to help them. And then when we're all together, and there's nobody else, we can all speak in a foreign tongue, and we'll understand what we're saying. But until then, until our language is purified, Bill, hey there. I love you, brother. It's a little warm in here. Um, uh, you know, we, gotta, we, we, use what we, we use the language that we can to try to communicate. Some of us speak multiple languages. And if, if I started speaking in a, in a foreign language that I know, you, most of you would not understand it. Some of you might, Heidi might, and a couple, but most of you wouldn't. Or some of you come from foreign countries. So we have to, you know, you wouldn't, we wouldn't understand. I wouldn't understand Japanese or Chinese or Burmese or Russian or whatever other languages people might know here. So the name, I, I use it, I'm going to use the term Lord, don't be offended. Um, and that's just, you know, get over it. Grow up, get over it. I'm not talking about anybody here in this group. I'm talking about anybody that may be watching the video. Because I know we don't have a problem here. We're beyond that. I want to talk about the Lordship of Yeshua. He's your Savior. He's your Savior, but is He your Lord? Is He your Master? <laughs> we can say, oh yeah, He's my Lord. But is He really your Master?
And we're going to talk about what this term means and kind of the ramifications of it and what the scriptures say. Sadly, sadly, in the Hebrew roots, Messianic movement, whatever you want to call it, I hear a lot about the Torah, and that's good. I hear a lot of teaching. Well, not as much as I'd like, but there's still a lot out there. They talk about Yeshua. Some places they don't talk much about Him. Shame on them. But in good, solid, balanced congregations and teachings, teachers, they'll talk about Yeshua. They'll talk about the gospel message and they'll talk about Him as being the Savior or the Redeemer, and that's good. But what about the Lord of your lives? The Lord, the Master. Honestly, I've been in this movement for a while, and I don't hear a whole lot about that. I've never heard a teaching on it. I'm sure somebody has, but I don't hear much. It's an important subject, Jared. Very important. I'm going to prove it. It's easy to separate things out in our minds and use terms and religious terminology like Lord. And we have this idea in our brain, but getting it into the rest of our lives is a tough one. We can have a concept in our mind about Lord, but then how does that radiate out into all areas of our lives in what we do, say, and think? I can tell my wife I love her. I can say those words. But I've got to show her. She has a saying, don't tell me, show me. We can say, Lord, Lord, but are we, is He really the Lord of our lives? And we want to talk about that. See, part of connecting the dots Hebraically is getting out of the, in a sense, getting out of a Greek, Greco-Roman mindset. The Hebraic thought is very action-oriented. The verb, for example, is, forms the foundation of the, of the a Hebrew grammar, whereas the noun is the foundation of, of um, the, the grammar, I suppose, of most Euro, uh, Indo-European languages. But the, the, the Oriental mindset, in this case the Semitic languages, is very action-oriented. The verb, action, is the, is, the, is the basis of the Hebrew language. And it's based on what you do, not just what you say. It's not just based on form, it's based on substance, doing. You say, I love you, well show me. You say that, that I'm your master, well then act like it. But in the Greek mindset, the Western mindset, it's like, as long as you say the right words and look good, that's, that suffices. We're not going to be judged by how we look. We're going to be judged by what we say and whether we back it up with our actions. Many are they that come to me, will come to me in that day and say, Lord, 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 Lord. This is Matthew chapter 7, starting verse 21. Didn't we do this and this and this? You know, hey, we were real religious. Boy, we spoke in tongues and we cast out demons and we prophesied in your name. We, did, we, we even did a few miracles along the way. <laughs> He's going to say, depart from me, you workers of Torahlessness. I don't know you. You did not do what was important to me. You did not obey me. I was not your Lord. So I'm putting a call out to the teachers in the Hebrew Roots Movement, or the Messianic Movement, or the whatever, whatever you want to call it. The Torah Movement. That we need to make, bring the Lordship of Yeshua into all aspects of our lives. And to our shame, He is not. Yeah, the, ro the, the, role of, the role of Torah is trumpeted loudly throughout, you know, 
but 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 we've got to come to re realize and then the lordship of Yeshua is not well let's stop and think about this for a minute I'm going to say if we're not preaching the lordship of Yeshua then we are preaching a skewed Torah message it's skewed it's unbalanced it is unhealthy and it is wrong and you, you, you're, we're not reading what the apostles taught and following their example. We need to teach that the Torah and Yeshua, or I should say that, or we could say the message of the Torah and the message of Yeshua are synonymous concepts. The message of the Torah and the message of Yeshua are synonymous. That means they're equal to each other. They're indivisible. They can't be divided. Two sides of the same coin. You can't preach one without the other. Look, Yeshua is throughout. He's all over the Torah. I really get tired of hearing what the Jewish sages have to say about the Torah. They have a lot of good things. And I have many of their quotes in my Torah commentaries. I want to hear about Yeshua. And I want to hear how that points to Yeshua. I use, I use, I quote the, the, the rabbinic sages as a, as a launch pad in many of my teachings to, to help us to gain a fuller understanding of Yeshua. It's not an end in itself, it's a means to an end. That's why I quote them. It's not just an end in itself, because they did not come to an understanding of Yeshua. Or most of them didn't. So we don't want to park our car at that bus stop, or that garage, or stand at that bus stop, because it doesn't lead anywhere good. And yet I hear people constantly, well, so-and-so said this, and so-and-so, rabbi, whatever. Well, there's only one rabbi, and that's Yeshua. So I don't even call them rabbis. I do respect them. And there's a lot we can learn, as long as it brings us closer to the Messiah. So the Messiah is all over the Torah. And the Torah and the Messiah is all, all over the testimony of Yeshua, the apostolic scriptures. So let's connect the dots. Let me just give you these facts. In the New Testament, which I call, which the New Testament itself calls as the testimony of Yeshua, we hear, well, we hear a lot about the Messiah. The term Christos in the Greek, or where we get the word Christ, or Mashiach, Christos means the anointed one, the one that's smeared with, well, and it comes from Mashiach, or Messiah means one who's anointed or literally smeared with oil. That term applies 500, my glasses just keep getting blurry on me. I gotta, I don't like, it's getting smudgy. I, I don't know what's going on here. I guess I must be touching them. Anyway, that's better. I better keep that out. <laughs> um, the term Messiah in the New Testament, the Testament of Yeshua, occurs 569 times. That's a lot. That's really a major theme, his Messiahship. Make no mistake about it. But get a load of this one. The term Lord, Master, is the Greek word kurios. K-U-R-I-O-S appears some 745 times. Now I'm not saying his messiahship is less important because that term applies less than Lord or Kurios or Master. I'm just saying that Master or Lord appears a lot. And it is a prominent theme. You see, Yeshua has one name. His name is Yeshua. That's his flesh side. And on the, on the uh, divine side, his name is Yudhe Or some say, I say Yehovah. Some say Yahweh. Some say other things. But however you want to pronounce Yudhe Vavhe, Y-H-V-H or Y-H-W-H. The Greek, the Hebrew letters are Yud, He, Vav, He. Um, 
That, those are his names. Everything else is titles. Messiah is title. Jesus Christ. Christ isn't his last name. That's his title. And Lord is a title and he has many other titles. Just like Elohim has many titles. Um, Elohim is the Godhead. It's plural. Let's not get into that. That would be another discussion. So the, the, um, this, we need to promote this. We need to talk about this. This is very important. Over 700 references in the New Testament to the Lordship, Lordship of Yeshua. The Greek word for Lord is, as I said, kurios, and it's defined here as he to whom a person or a thing belongs about which he has power of deciding or master or Lord, the possessor and disposer of a thing, the owner, one who has control over a person, the master in the state, in the state or politically a sovereign prince, such as a, a chief, a king, a Roman emperor, or whatever. So you get the point of what it means. It can be used, and obviously this word can be used in a lot of different ways. Now, we know that he, I'm just going to throw a few scriptures at you. We know that he is the Lord because Acts 10.36 and Romans 10.12 says that Yeshua is the Lord of all. And the Lordship of Yeshua over all aspects of our lives must be stressed in the Hebrew Roots Movement. He says he's the Lord over all. That's there in the Bible. Currently, his lordship is not stressed, even though it is mentioned, like I said, more than 700 times. That's not a small number, more than 700 times in the testament of Yeshua. We must teach that the lordship of Yeshua equates with the rule of Torah in our lives. Now this may be a hard concept for those people in the church to understand in the Christian church because they've been taught against the Torah. They've been, they've been, or that is, the Torah has been taught against and they've taught to have a version, an aversion against the law of Moses and these things. But we must restore the truth, the fact that when you say Yeshua, you are saying Torah. He's the living, breathing, walking Torah. I'm going to prove that. You all know this, but it's important that we say it again and again and again. Many people, let's say in the church, that's not taught. And sadly, the pendulum has swung to the opposite extreme, and many in the Hebrew Roots movement are gravitating and emphasizing, overemphasizing the rule of Torah in their lives, but they're not emphasizing the rule of Yeshua as Lord in their lives. And like I said, these are equivalent or synonymous or parallel concepts. It's really very simple. Let me, let me, let me share it. If I had a whiteboard up here, I would write like a, an equation, like a mathematical equation. Like 2 plus 2 equals 4. But this is how it goes. The Torah, the law of God is given to Moses and the children of Israel, and which actually was given to the uh, patriarchs before that, and exists from the foundation of the world. And, it, and, and it's literally, it literally means concepts or precepts or teachings or laws or instructions in righteousness of Yehovah Elohim. The Torah is the mind and the thoughts and the character or an expression of, it's not the fullness of, but it's an expression of the mind and the character and the thoughts of Yehovah Elohim as revealed to man and put in a codified form which now is in our Bibles or in a Torah scroll. And the essence of it is how do we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself? It's the expression of Elohim's love, how to love him on a horizontal or vertical level and our fellow man on a horizontal level. Love is a fulfilling the law. Love is a summation of the law. It shows us how to love. So the Torah is the word of Elohim. 
John 1, 1 and John 1, 14 says that Yeshua is Elohim. In the beginning was Elohim. And the Word was with Elohim. And the Word was Elohim. And then it goes on to show in verse 14, well later on, the next few verses, that Yeshua is the Word of Elohim. And that He was made flesh in verse 14. So now we have this equation. The Torah equals the Word of Elohim equals Yeshua. This is not deep truth. This is not, this is not rocket science. This is really 101. And I know you all understand that, but this is a, 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 a revolutionary concept to some people in the, uh, in, in the church. And we need to lovingly proclaim this and share that with them. Now, it wasn't God the Father or Elohim the Father that spoke from Mount Sinai or appeared to Moses or, or Joshua or Abraham and Jacob. It was Yeshua in his pre-incarnate state as the word of Elohim. And again, I have articles and teachings on that. We can't prove that right now. But Stephen recognized that and said that in, in Acts 7. Yeshua recognized that when he said, I am. And I, before Abraham was, I am in the Gospel of John. And they, the Jews picked up stones to throw him because, to throw at him, to kill him because they, they, they said he was making himself equal to be equal with Elohim because, and they, they viewed that as blasphemy and they were going to kill him. And there's many other scriptures we could give to show, you know, Paul says that Yeshua was the one that led them in the wilderness. And was that rock that they drank water from, allegorically speaking? So Yeshua is the one that gave the Torah in his pre-incarnate. He wasn't called Yeshua yet. He was called the Devar or the Word. He, and he gave that Word at Mount Sinai. He spoke to Moses and he gave us this. So Elohim equals Yeshua equals the Word, equals Yeshua, equals the Torah, and Yeshua is the Word of Elohim incarnate, and He's the Master of our lives. So the Torah and Yeshua, if the Torah equals Yeshua, and Yeshua equals our, equals the, our Lord or a Master, then the Torah should be the Master of our lives. And when I say the Torah, I'm talking about the written Torah and the living Torah. Now we understand that not all of Torah we can do. There are some things that we can't do. Because we're either not a, a, a female, or we're not a male if we're a female, or we're not a farmer, or we're not a Levite, or there's no tabernacle, or we're not living in the land of Israel. We understand all that. Or some things were fulfilled in Yeshua. Like the book of Hebrews says, the, the sacrificial system and the Levitical priesthood system. So I understand all that. So those parts of Torah that we can do, we are called to live up to them, do the best that we can. Living in exile among the Goyim or the Gentiles, we do the best that we can, showing the Father that we have a heart of obedience and we want to, and we do the best that we can, living up to the light of understanding that we have at this point in time. And then beyond that, we rely on His grace to forgive us and to cover over us and to help us to grow into more of obedience to Him. So Yeshua, the Torah, the Word of Elohim, and Elohim are all synonymous concepts. And I'd like to draw your attention to emphasize this point in Romans 10, 4 through 8. I'm not going to turn there, Romans 10, 4 through 8. But in there, the Apostle Paul is quoting Deuteronomy 30, where Moses says, you know, the Torah, he's talking about the, the written Torah, is not so difficult for you. It's not difficult, it's not beyond your reach, so that you have to go to heaven, or you have to go to find it, or you have to go to the deepest depths of the earth, or go somewhere here or there to find it. It's near you, it's in you. 
It's in your heart. It's been given to you. Well, Paul quotes that verse, that passage from Deuteronomy 30, and he takes out the word Torah and he puts in the word Yeshua. So instead of saying, the Torah is not too difficult for you. You don't have to go here to find it. And then he says, Yeshua, following and obeying Yeshua is not so difficult for you that you got to go to heaven to find him or go to the deepest, deepest depths of the earth to find him. But he is near you. He is in you. He's, he's, he's inside of you. And then it goes on to say, and if you will confess him with your mouth and believe in your heart, you shall be saved. 10 and 9, what, 9 and 10. You know, people confess, I digress here, people confess that salvation passage all the time. Hey, just confess Jesus as your, as your Lord and Savior and you'll be saved. With that verse. But they don't read the verses before that. The, the immediately before that. That He is the living Torah. And if you're going to confess Him, then that living Torah is living inside of you and, and you're going to do what it says. If you love me, keep my commandments, my Torah commandments. And Paul, in Paul's mind, <clears throat> the living Torah and the written Torah were synonymous concepts. That's really important for you to get that in your mind so you can share that with people. As you lo lovingly share that with people from Romans 10. That in Paul's mind, the Torah and Yeshua were synonymous. And he says, look, you can do it. It's not impossible to keep the Torah. you got the living Torah living inside of you through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not hard. Just do it. How hard is it to rest on the Shabbat? How hard is it not to eat pork? How hard is it to keep the feast days? How hard is it to love your neighbor? That's some, one thing that the, you know, the, the Christian church teaches. How hard is it not to steal from your neighbor or covet your neighbor's goods or not commit adultery with your neighbor's wife? or whatever, will not worship false gods. That's the Torah. This is not difficult. Especially with Yeshua's help. Hallelujah. And of course, in Romans 10.4, it says that Christ, or Messiah, is the end of the Torah. Well, that's what it says in most of our English Bibles. The Greek word there is teleo, and it means the end goal, or the end result, or telos. I don't remember, uh, let's see, telos. Uh, would be the noun to let, oh, anyway, whatever. Help me out here. Uh, anyway, it, 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 it's, they're, it's still the same, they're cognates. Anyway, he's the end goal. He is what the Torah points to, and he takes us to the higher levels of the Torah, and yet we still follow and obey the letter of the Torah as much as we can, too. I'm no, I don't want to get too much into that. That's a whole other discussion. But he's not the end, that's not what the word means, as in, at least how it's used here, as in the termination of it. So therefore, he did it, I don't have to, therefore I can go out and, what, commit adultery? Violate my neighbor's wife? Steal? Break the Sabbath? Go worship false gods? Dishonor my parents? You know, whatever. No, that's not what it's saying there, but that's what it's been twisted well, that's not what the Christian church teaches, but that's ultimately what their philosophy or their logic leads you to. And that's why it's erroneous. So, in Paul's mind, Romans 10, 4 through 8, the Torah were, the, Yeshua and the Torah were synonymous concepts. Now, Yeshua's, what is Yeshua's right to the title of Lord or Master? Why, what, how, how did he earn this title? How do we, how do we you know, like a king is a, a king because he was the father, the son of a king, was the son of a king, was the son of a king going way back however many hundreds or thousands of years, and nobody questions that. <clears throat> and how they became king in the first place, well, it was probably whoever had the biggest armies and the most amount of money or whatever. I don't know who owned the land. But nobody questions that, at least in countries where there's kings and queens. So how do we know? Because this is a good question, because why should he be the Lord of my life? What? Who is he to be the Lord of my life? Now, you may not say that, but there are people that would ask that question. Well, let me tell you why. Uh, these are good questions, and we need to know the answers to them. And by the way, 
This teaching is up on my blog. If you're taking notes and you have access to the internet, you can download it. I uploaded it today. So it's up there on the blog. And it's going to be on our website also. It's just short teaching, but it's important. Let me just say that Yeshua has the legal right to exercise his lordship over our lives for the following reasons. He has the right to exercise lordship over our lives for the following reasons. First of all, he is God. He is Elohim. If we had no other reason beyond that, that ought to stop and end the discussion. Be the beginning and the end of the discussion right there. He is the God of the universe, the creator, the Elohim. As such, we owe him our obedience. We owe it to him. If there was nothing in it for us, we owe it to him. Hi guys. How you doing? See those thumbs going? He is our Elohim. And he, Yeshua, created everything. He made everything. As Elohim, or as part of the Godhead, he made everything. John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.3, uh, 1, uh, Colossians 1.16, Hebrews 11.3. He made everything. So he made us. He is the greater one. We are the created being. He is our master. He made us. We owe it to him. He gave us life. He can take life away. We owe it to him. That's it. Need we say any more? But we will say more. The Father has given him all authority on heaven and earth. Has given him all authority. Not only did he make it make us, but he has the authority to do whatever he wants. Matthew 28, 18 and Ephesians 1, 22. Yeshua said in Matthew 28, 18, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's like in the entire universe. That's the entire universe. He has all that authority. That's why he's our Lord. Someday when we see him in his glorious presence with his face shining like the sun, we're going to understand what it means, what power means. I mean, it, none of us have ever seen him in his full glory. Maybe, maybe somebody's seen him in vision, but we've never seen him in his full glory. If he got anywhere near this earth in his full glory, this, this earth would just be like a vapor. It would just sizzle and and e dematerialize. It would just, it would just be like, a, like dropping a, a, a water, a drop of water on a hot stove. Tss, it's gone. That's power. It's really easy to take him lightly because we haven't seen him and we really don't have a fear of Elohim like we should and you know a lot of things and he's just kind of this mental concept that we you know have a warm fuzzy feeling about in our heart or whatever our concept is but we need to reestablish the fear of Elohim I think the fear of Elohim is behind understanding his lordship if we had the fear and I'm not even planning to talk about that subject but if we had the fear the right concept of who he is I think it would make us to have a much healthier understanding and respect. Elohim, or the Godhead, has made Yeshua both Lord and Messiah. Acts 2.36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that Elohim has made this Yeshua. This is, Paul, this is Peter's sermon during on the day of Pentecost. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that Elohim has made this Yeshua, whom you crucified, both Lord or Master, and the Messiah. It's interesting he put Lord or Master first, even ahead of Messiah. I don't want to speculate too much on this, but is it possible that Peter, when he was preaching that sermon, considered the lordship of Yeshua to be a more important concept than even his messiahship? 
It's possible. He couldn't have been the Messiah unless he was the Lord. Because when he died, because he was the creator, his life, because he created all of us, his life was of more worth more and of greater value than all of human beings put together because he made us and the created is always more valuable than the thing it creates I've used this example if I go out if I'm a, a house builder and I go out and build a few houses my life is more valuable than the houses I build you can't put a price on a human life or if I build widgets or build a factory or whatever but Yeshua, Yeshua made everything. His life is worth more than ours. He's the builder of the house. And we are the house. So without his lordship, they're, 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 he, his life wouldn't have been worth more than ours. He was just another human being. But because he was Elohim, because he was Lord, his worth, his law, he could, he could be the Messiah. And as such, we need to worship and obey him. Maybe that's, I'm just speculating, maybe that's why Peter put Lord first in Acts 2 verse uh, 36, even ahead of Messiah. Luke 6, 46 says, if Yeshua is our Lord or our master, then we must obey him. Yeshua said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you do not do the things which I say? You don't do what I say. Yeah, you say Lord, Lord, but you're not obeying me. And we've all been there. And we're learning about what it means to obey him. Not just the parts of the word of God that we, that we want to obey. Not just the parts that are, where we don't have to give anything up. Well, I'm not going to give up eating pork because I like bacon too well. Yeah, there's people like that. I don't care if you don't like bacon. It's an abomination to eat it. And it's not holiness. All the a bunch of the holiness scriptures that are found in, 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 in that portion of the Torah, Leviticus 11, that talk about the clean, unclean meats. It's a holiness issue. You want to be holy? You got to be like him. I guarantee you, Yeshua did not eat pork or shellfish or whatever. Yeshua, now this is a very important one, because Yeshua's life was worth more than ours put together, all of ours put together, because he made us when he died for our sins, redeeming us from the penalty of violating his laws and breaking them. He paid for us. We all know this. He paid for us. He bought and paid for us. He redeemed us with his precious blood. So therefore, he owns us. We were dead before we knew Yeshua. We were the walking dead, the walking condemned, the walking damned. Until he redeemed us with his blood, we were dead in our sins and trespasses against his laws. But he redeemed us, hallelujah. And therefore, we're indebted to him. He bought and paid for us. He's the one that gave us life and eternal life. So we better recognize him as Lord. Because we had no hope otherwise. Guys, that's just the reality. That's law, that's legalities of it all. Look, <clears throat> if there's a guy that's on death panel, death row, he, unless he murdered somebody or whatever, and he's on death row. And I go and I die in that person's place. And that person is able to, you know, the, this guy owes me his life. The, ju the, the justice was settled. The price was paid. Somebody died for that murder. And this guy was set free. Because I exchanged my life for him. Or let's put, you know, whatever. Or if I, if I, if I, let's say one of my kids is drowning and I rescue him and I rescue my child, but in the process, I myself drown. We hear about stories like this. That my child, whoever it was I rescued, they owed my life. 
Or there's people that are in battle, in, war, in wars, and somebody will give their life, throw their body on a grenade to save their platoon or whatever. They, they owe that guy their life, because otherwise they would have died. We owe Yeshua our life. Worship Him. Obey Him. Because outside of Him we would have had no life. We wouldn't even be alive, eventually. So 1 Peter 1, 18-19 says, we were, He bought and paid for us with His blood. He redeemed us. Philippians 2.10 says that, As the Lord, every knee will bow to Yeshua. You know, we ought to get in the practice of bowing. Every knee will bow, eventually, before Him, when He comes back. See, you may as well get in the habit of doing it now. Why not? Get on those knees and worship Him. Because he is the Lord. He's the master. Our bodies are the temple. I'm giving reasons why we should worship and, and why he should be our master. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we are not our own. We were bought with a price. Therefore, we must glorify Yeshua in our lives. He put his precious Holy Spirit in us. He gave us life. He bought and paid for us. Worship him. On this saint, on this earth, another point. On this earth, the saints are ambassadors for Yeshua and his kingdom. You know, when an ambassador lives in Washington, D.C., representing another country, he can't just go say his own stuff. He can't do anything that is treasonous to his country. He's got to represent the government of that country. Otherwise, they'll jerk their ambassador back and put another one in there. And if he's guilty of treason, they will punish him according to the laws of that country. Well, we represent the kingdom of heaven. We're called ambassadors in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. We're the ambassadors of another kingdom. we got to represent our king and follow his marching orders. Guys, these are all mental concepts, but we got to get it into our, into our being and everything we do and say and think. We're representing Yeshua. He's our Lord. What would Yeshua do? What did Yeshua do? Not just what would he do, what did he do, and let's go do that. That's what we got to say. What did Yeshua do in all circumstances and situations? Moving right along. In 1 Peter, in 1 Peter 2, 5-9, through 9, we are Yeshua's priesthood, his own special people who he brought out of darkness. We're his people. We belong to him. He's the one that brought us out of spiritual darkness, so he's our Lord. It's interesting, those who are, were closest to Yeshua, his disciples and apostles, they all called him, called themselves his bond servants. His doulos is the Greek word. It means servant, slave, or bond servant. Oh, I'm the slave of no man. Well, good, and you're the slave of your own carnal, nat carnal nature and the slave of the devil. You, you can't, unless you're a slave of Yeshua, you are a slave of the world, the flesh, and the devil. You can't, there's no middle ground. If you're not bowing the knee to Yeshua, if you're not on your face before him, and if he's not the Lord of your life, then you are a slave to the world, the flesh, and the devil. And those three all go together. They all work together against Yeshua. It's that simple. Can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve two masters at once. Paul called himself a slave of Yeshua in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Galatians 1.10, Philippians 1.10. James called him that, called himself. James was the brother of Yeshua. His name was Yaakov. And he called himself, I'm the bondservant in James 1.1. 1, 1. Peter calls himself a bondservant in 2 Peter 2.1. Yehuda, or Jude, who was also a brother of Yeshua, called himself a bondservant of Yeshua. There you have it. And then at his second coming, Yeshua, he's coming as the supreme king, the Lord or the master to judge all men. And he's, Yeshua is the only person who holds the power over life and death. And as a just judge, he, coming back in the end times to bring judgment on this earth, he's going to judge everybody according to what, everybody, what they have done. All the words and the thoughts and the deeds that they have done, whether good or bad. 
and he will determine who has eternal life and who doesn't. And some will go into the lake of fire. Yes, the lake of fire is real. It's not burning yet, it's going to burn. There's no hellfire burning yet. It's something that's coming. The Bible doesn't teach that there's a hellfire now, but it's coming. The dead are in the graves, waiting the resurrection, while the righteous are, and then the righteous, the unrighteous dead will be brought back to life long enough to stand before the judgment seat and bow before the throne of Yeshua at the white throne judgment at the end of the millennium and then after that they will be thrown in the lake of fire and be burned up. Boom. Just like that. Yeshua has a lot of parables where he talks about him coming back as the king or as the well as a king or as, as a nobleman where he talks about he's going to judge the unrighteous and the righteous. The day of judgment is coming. That's why we need him to be the Lord, because that will keep us on the right side of things so we don't, we don't, um, we don't fall on the, on the judgment side of his judgments. I want to fall on the reward side of his judgment, not the, the judgment side. We have the many parables, the parable of the talents, the laborer's penny, the sheep and the goats parable, the wheat and tares, the wicked vine dressers, the unforgiving servant, and the wedding feast parable. A bunch of parables talk about him coming back. And he's going to separate the wheat from chaff. He's going to judge the unrighteous servants. He's going to throw someone into the fire. And on and on. In, in conclusion, if he is our Lord, which he is, how should we act? As our Lord, Yeshua as our Lord, how should we act? How should we then live? If he is our Lord, how should we then live? We are not to live to ourselves, but live to Yeshua our Lord, because we belong to him, and we are accountable to him for all our actions, for we must all stand before his judgment seat. Go read Romans 14, 7 through 12. We should take every argument and high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim and bring it captive to the obedience of Messiah. Every thought even needs to get bring, brought, be brought, and if, if our thoughts and how much more our words and our actions need to be brought into the captivity to the obedience to the word and the spirit of Yeshua. 2 Corinthians 10.5 If we belong to Messiah, then our lives are hid in him and we must set our mind on things above, not on things below. This means that we must put to death our carnal passions, our, the old man, our old man with his sinful deeds, and as a new creation or a new man in Yeshua, we need to strive to be renewed in the knowledge according to the image of Yeshua our Creator. All that's contained in Colossians 1, um, 3 rather, chapters one through, uh, verses 1 through 10. Philippians 2, 5 says that we must seek to have the mind of Yeshua, to think and to act as he did. We need to be asking ourselves constantly, is this glorifying my master? Is this honoring my master? Is this something my master would do? My Lord. It's hard, pretty hard as you're going through your daily life to be thinking about that all the time. But we need to think about that until these things become automatic. And we just automatically do it without thinking. In our secular work, in our jobs, we must conduct ourselves as if Yeshua were our employer and our master, because he is. Ephesians 6, verses 5 and 7. And finally, we must view ourselves as servants of Yeshua. And come to the place, as did the apostles, of seeing ourselves as his bondservants. I know that I really don't understand what it means to be a bondservant like the apostles did, because they paid the dear price. They paid the ultimate price. Almost all of them died for their faith. And they were persecuted and whipped and beat and imprisoned and on and on and on, shipwrecked. 
I haven't had to go through that. But I will tell you, just personally, when I hit about age 50, several years ago, and I'd been in the ministry for 20, non-stop ministry for 20 some years, and pastoring for about, at that time, I don't know, 13 years or whatever it was, I finally began to dawn on me a little, a little bit what it meant to be a bond servant. Now maybe some of you got that a little sooner than I did, and maybe, maybe your heads are a little bit thinner than mine. But I finally realized, was beginning to realize what it means to not do my will and to do His will, whether I feel like it or not. You know, I think as parents, we can understand this. Those of us that have raised our children, you got to do a lot of things for your kids, and even when we're married, that we don't feel like. Uh, there's lots of times I like to stay at home and not go to work, or whatever, but I have to, because I have a family and a wife and, and children and all that. If it was just me, I'd probably be, be a lazy bum half the time. Well, probably not. But I grew up on a farm. I learned to work and love work. But I probably wouldn't be working as hard as I do. I don't know. Who knows? I'm not there. But the point is, is that it finally began to dawn on me a few years ago, a little bit at least, what it meant to be a bond servant. And to the point where, not my will be done, but yours be done. And I really don't care. I don't care. I just want to do your will. I don't care what I do. I just want to do your will because that's, that's the best. That's the best thing. Whether I understand it or like it or not, that's the best thing for me, is to be in your will. That's what ultimately is going to be the best for me, so I trust your judgment. And I began to come to that point, and I know I have much higher levels to learn, but it began to get through this gray matter a little bit. So I just want to leave you with that. Is he your savior? Uh, he, he, if, if Yeshua is your savior, he's your savior, but is he your Lord? Is he your master? And do you really have the mentality of being a slave or a, or a servant, a bond servant to Yeshua? Lord, help us. These are difficult concepts. It's easy to spout the words and to have the mental concept, but then to inculcate that into all areas of our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, walking one step at a time in our daily lives and being cognizant of that, that's not easy. It's not easy. It's tough. But Lord, help us. Help us, Father. Help us to embrace that reality and that concept and let it radiate into all areas of our life the Lordship of Messiah in our lives. And especially as it relates to those around us, our wives, our husbands, our family members, those people around us that where we let our guard down and sometimes we don't evidence the nature and the Lordship of Yeshua, but more often than not, our fleshly natures. So Father, help us to become the people that you want us to be so that we, you can do with us what you want, which is ultimately what it's, what it's all about and the best thing for us in Yeshua's name. Amen. Seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon his name, he is near, he is near, he is near. Yeshu Hashem Be'im Atzov
seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon his name. He is near. Near. He is near. Yeshua Hashem behimatzor. Kerahu. 